Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Disaffected Nigerian podcast. Um, this is probably the first time a lot of you will be seeing my face. Um, the thing is, the podcast is taking a new approach. I intend to have amazing conversation with amazing people going, going forward. And uh, it doesn't take anything away from what I've been doing all along. I'll continue making my essay content, but I just feel I need to engage with amazing people going forward as well. So today, I have an amazing personality. I have followed his work for a couple of years. He's a human rights advocate. He's a humanitarian as well. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mr. Liu Higwe to the podcast. Welcome. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Yeah, thank you, Yemi, and uh, thank you, listeners. And I hope we are going to have an amazing time. All right. Thank you. So for those who may not know you, could you uh, care yeah. to share introduce yourself to my listeners as well okay well my name like you said i'm leo igwe i'm from uh of course southeast nigeria but i spent much of my life in southwestern part of nigeria um i was uh, born in a village and i spent the first 12 years of my life living in a small village and it was from there i got exposed to a mix of so many beliefs traditional beliefs christian beliefs and uh, from there, I um, enrolled in a seminary. It was actually my mom who took me to the seminary. So at 12 years, I, if I tell you I went to the seminary, I'm sure you should, you should know it's not true. So I was taken to the seminary. So and there, I got trained to be a priest for a couple of years. I spent about 12 years there because after my high school, I studied philosophy, did a bit of theology, then I left. Huh. And uh, leaving the seminary was like when I was done. You know, when you mm. say you are done, I, I yeah. was done with religion. Religion mm. from the point of view of profession, mm. that's as in what I stand for, but not religion, because if you are living in Nigeria, you can't get done with religion, because if you, <laughs> even if you don't want it, they will trust it on you. If you are, it's not, if not in the bus, when you are registering anything, it will come up. So, um, the, so for me, religion is something I'm interested in. It's a point of inquiry, it's something I... That arouses my curiosity. In fact, it's something I like talking about because that's when you can see human beings either in their in their lowest in terms of intellect or in their highest, as the case may be. So, uh, when I left the seminary, that was in 1994. Um, a few two years after that, I started the humanist movement. Well, I didn't start it because oh, I wanted to do. A, I needed my own platform. I needed. You know what to identify with. I needed to tell people this is where I'm coming from because we merely you are saying you are Leo, you are from the east. Of course, they assume you are Igbo, you are, they assume yeah. you are Christian. They yeah. assume you believe whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. So I try to provide a platform where I tell them, hey man, don't lump me together. Don't call me this and all that. So I started it and of course started getting a few people around and the whole thing started spreading. That was before the internet. So, mm -hmm. but now the internet came, the whole thing is out of my hand. So you can mm -hmm. go online and get a lot of groups and platforms and people, you know, agreeing, disagreeing on one point or another. So um, right now, I'm, of course, contributing to the humanist movement, but at the local, regional, international level. Uh, but I'm more focused on um, campaigning against witchcraft accusation and stopping all sorts of atrocities that are committed in the name of religion, then promoting critical thinking in school. So... Some really, that is uh, all about me. Yeah, we'll talk more on the anti-witchcraft advocacy later on. Now, you said okay. something that you can't escape religion in Nigeria. Now, I don't know whether you can hear there is a church close by um, doing uh, <laughs> doing uh, <laughs> a program, and the noise I feel is interfering with with the podcast. You know, it's just one of now, those. But, but yeah, but the coincidence is that there's also a church behind, oh. <laughs> beside where I am. I'm at I'm at what they call a Bible guest house in Ibadan, and there's mm -hmm. also a church behind. They're also doing some 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 kind of song there, and it's also yeah. but it's not coming. It's not very obvious because I'm inside the room as I speak, so oh. you can see now what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, it's one of those things you can't escape. All right. Yeah. So I want to know: Would you describe yourself an atheist? Yeah, yes, I do. You know, let me tell you why. You see, okay. I don't think there is a God as defined. Because when you tell me a God is somebody who is everywhere, in other words, he's here now as we are speaking. Mm -hmm. I don't see any evidence that he's here as we are speaking. 
okay? And, oh, God is somebody who knows everything. How do I know that somebody knows everything? I, don't, I still don't know, okay? God is, uh, you know, um, omni, omni, there are all these omni qualifications yeah, yeah. in terms of, yeah. okay, he's all good. How do I know? Look at the yeah. suffering people are going through. You know, mm -hmm. both, both those who are believers and not believers are going through the cash problem. They will see prayer and go to the bank and they still come back empty. So I don't see any evidence mm -hmm. for God as they say. Okay. But I know that people use God, the God idea to make sense of their good and the bad they encounter in life. But that's entirely everything. You can put dog there. You can put a dog there. You can put <laughs> anything that comes into your mind there yeah. and it will still be in other words if i say now okay let me pray to ogologolo before leaving ogologolo protect me today if i come back i give glory to ogologolo do you hear what i'm saying so where you put god you can't put anything there and you still get the same result so mm -hmm. so what am i trying to say i'm saying that as people define it i know i don't think there is a, I, don't, I don't think that god exists yes so i can define myself as an atheist I would say that to a very large extent, I share your sentiments, though I have a very nuanced view of religion. Um, it is not a coincidence that our ancestors, like religion evolved with humanity. I don't think there's any coincidence in that. Religion has been used as an attempt to make sense of the world. It has been used as an attempt to make sense of um, certain phenomena our ancestors couldn't explain. And also in modern days, I believe that religion still serves a purpose, actually, from a sociological perspective. I do believe that it serves a purpose, especially in a country like Nigeria, in a continent like Africa, that we are still struggling with the basic necessities. There is, there is abject poverty on the continent. And it's, it's a very difficult life to live as an African, if you are going to be real. It's very difficult. And uh, a lot of people use religion has, as a cope. You know, it's an escapism for them. It's it's mm. it's where they derive refuge. It's where they derive succor to escape mm. the vicissitudes of life, to escape the dystopian mm. realities of living in a country like Nigeria, mm. a continent like Africa. So, from that mm. standpoint, I do believe that religion serves a purpose. I mm. I genuinely believe it serves a purpose. Now, whether it is factually true or not, that's a different argument. Now, what mm -hmm. you you can make you can make the case that religion gives false hope. It gives false illusion. Yeah, we can we can make that case. But mm -hmm. from a broader perspective, I do believe that people still need it to, to make sense of life in a way to you know mm -hmm. seek refuge from what is wrong with them. You know, and mm -hmm. I do envy religious people in a sense that let's say you're confronted with a problem and you kneel and pray to God, at least within those five, 10 minutes, mm -hmm. we can make the case that there is a kind of, of peace that comes to them within those five, 10 minutes of prayer. There's a this kind of body they feel is lifted from their chest or from their neck. Now, again, whether that prayer gets answered or not is a different argument. I, I get that. I, I do get that. But I believe religion serves a way. It serves a purpose from a sociological perspective. It helps people make sense of the world. Now, whether that's true or not, but it, it's, it helps them make sense of the world. Now, what do you say to that? You see, <laughs> you know, when people say, oh, uh, this thing is beneficial, you know, you know, is, is serving it like now is serving a purpose, and but Nigeria is a clear demonstration. What purpose is it serving? Okay, what purpose is it serving Nigerians? I, I keep saying this. Okay, now let me tell you, as I speak to you now, you just like you said, people are singing and are praying in the church. Yeah, temporarily yeah. trying to forget that there's no cash in the house, and tra temporarily trying to forget they need to go and work. Temporarily trying to forget. After that, after that temporary forgetfulness, they still come back to the same situation. True. Okay. True. And all that. So what I'm trying to say now is that is it not a way to sanctify our stagnation? Uh. Instead of us asking ourselves, what how do we make in quote more productive use of this time? Remember that these people who are singing could actually go and open a band and entertain people and get paid and get some money. Remember that these people could do something more profitable with this time. Go to the airports and see that airports, they don't sleep. Many airports don't sleep. You get this? In yeah. other words, you can walk at night, you can walk during the day. We can run 24-hour economy, you mm -hmm. know, that get people employed. And not seeking ways to escape from a problem, only to return to that problem in a worse situation. What I'm saying here is that while I am 
because my PhD is in religious studies. I can I connect with what you're saying in terms of the fact that religion serves a social function. But we also need to step this down because you see, you know, go home to the people who are praying temporarily now. Go home with them and look at the meal, the, the, the what they're going to eat. Go home with them now and look at the, the what is in their bank account. Go home with them and see how they're starving and how they are, how they are undernourishing, how they are, you know, people are not feeding well. You know why? Because they have spent all their life escaping from the problem that stays them on their face. So why we try to say that, yeah, it's has a beneficial purpose. We should not run away from the harm. We should yeah. not run away from the fact that as people escape temporarily, constantly, they come back, worse off, and they really have to find a way. Why are we having crime? Yesterday I was moving in the in the in, I was moving I, I was in a in a taxi and there was this uproar. I think somebody in an uh, Okada either stole um, snatched a phone from somebody in Keke and they started pursuing the person. Okay, now mm. go and go and find out that person very likely is a religious person mm. and is is gonna go to church to pray or mosque to pray. So mm. how can we talk about so much religiosity and so talk about so much criminality, so much poverty, so much despair? You know, you know, within our society. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, there's a there's a tendency for us to really talk about all oh, the benefits. What about the harm? What about True. the stagnation? True. Why are I we where we are today? I don't. Why exactly can't we all the explore the plan? Look at now they're going to Mars. Yeah. A lot of people are still taught that it's angels that are out there, not planets. A lot of people still wake up, they look up the sky and they pray and they bow their head. Now, another people look up the sky and say, how do we get our satellite there and relay information and use it to make our internet faster? Some people are asking, how do we tap the energies from the sun and use it to electrify and power our cities? No, what I'm trying to say here now is that we should also look at, you know, the, the harm that is being done to the society as a result of the fact that people continue to use religion to escape for the problem only to come back to find out that the problem is worse and more complicated as demonstrated in our country, Nigeria. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with anything you've said. Okay, but what do you say to people who say that um, the problem is the people that have abused religion? You know, it, I'm very sure you typically get that response from, let's say, Christians or pastors or something. So they will tell you that, no, 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 the problem is not Christianity. The problem is people that have abused Christianity. So what do you say to that? Yeah, you see, you know, anything can be abused. Let me, let me just tell you, anything can be abused. Religion can inspire a lot of fantastic ideas. Architecture. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Look at some of the mosques or churches, and if they allow some of our shrines also to do, I'm talking about the traditional religious yeah. um, uh, architecture. You yeah. know, except uh, that's another harm again. You know, they keep destroying themselves because they want to overtake, they want to overrule others. Because yeah. if they allow our Shongo architectural Edifice. If they, if, they, if they can allow the Amadi or her, the traditional religious distance to stay, you will know that religion can also inspire work of art. Definitely. Beautiful, fantastic work of art. Definitely. Music. Okay? Do you get it? Music. People, a lot of very, even up till now, I want to tell you, I still sing a lot of religious songs they taught us in school. And I want to tell you, the call to prayer by some imams, the way they do it. Yeah. You know, yeah. They do it in such a way that in the morning, sometimes I like hearing it. But does that tell me that there is a God? No. It tells me there are human beings being inspired uh, by some ideas. Okay? So yeah. what I'm trying to say here now is that can we put religion on the same table where we put everything, music, any work of art by a human being? The answer is no. Very often they don't want. And that is where I have a problem. Put it in the... In the put, put, put religion as cultural. Something that we imbibed over the years and something that we continue to change and renew, that's fine. It can be abused. And when it's abused, we can check it. But do you know what? <laughs> when you want to be abused, they say, oh, don't, you know, no, no, you don't. You don't have the right. Don't tell us anything. No, there's nothing wrong with it. And yeah. even if you want to say it, if you are not careful, they will kill you, especially yeah. when it comes to one of the religions. I'm sure you know, you understand the religion. Yeah, I, I, mean, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm a call that religion if, you, if, if need be. But for that, let's, let's know. We all know the religion yeah. in question. So yeah. what am I trying to say is that, yes, it can be abused. But how do we know something can be abused or used usefully when you don't allow us freely to look at them, criticize it, turn it up and down, you know, and all that. So I'm not contesting the fact that people abuse religion, but they should open the religious space for thorough 
proper assessment like every other work of human art and creation. I've, I've always held that opinion also. I've always, I don't think religion should enjoy any immunity from criticism or critique. Yes. I don't think so. Let's subject yeah. everything to scrutiny, including atheism as well. Everything sure. should be subjected to atheism. The moment we begin to say we cannot criticize this, we cannot analyze this, then we yeah. are making that thing sacred. And I don't think any decent society, especially a democratic society, should have yeah. you know sacred cows, so to speak, when it comes to ideologies and belief system and what have you. I was going to ask you to provide some advantages of religion, but I think you already answered that. You said religion has inspired some amazing work of heart, you know, architecture. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's true. In, in Yoruba uh, culture, which I'm a part of, the, this genre, Fuji music, was actually inspired. Okay. It, it, it has uh, origins in, in yeah. Islam, you know, all these uh, imams that do call to prayer. You know, it has okay. origins in that. And even if you, if you listen to a typical Fuji song, you can hear that in it. You know, and it's also not a coincidence that most singers today, pop singers, they grew up in a church. They grew up in a church choir, and from yeah. there they transition into pop music. So mm -hmm. definitely, religion it does offer some utilitarian value in that regard. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let me ask you about the latest on Mubarak Bala. Perhaps for those who may not know, could you uh, give us uh, tell us who Mubarak Bala is for who, who may not know, and then then from yeah. there the latest about um. About him. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think we we're talking about religion and the benefits and the harm and yeah. use and all that. So I think the case of Mubarak Bala is one, you know, what it was, it is typical and it can help us understand this. Okay. Okay. Good. So um, uh, Bala is just, um, he came out as an ex Muslim that was in 2014. Uh, so I wasn't in the country. I was studying for my uh, doctorate then. And they told me about him. I was like, wow, who does that? Mm. That, was, that was my reaction. Because mm -hmm. knowing with what I knew about, you know, his, um, the, that's the Islam as practice in the North and all that, yeah. I know that for somebody to come out openly like that, the person is just trying to, he's taking a lot of risk, you know, yeah. and all that. So, so um, but, you know, the, the thing, the controversy went on and eventually died down. And, you know, he was, uh, he started going about his business. And I came back, that was to 2017. We met at a conference, I think 2018 or 2017, thereabouts. So, and we met physically, and we've been interacting since then. And he has been so much interested in leading a kind of awakening, you know, in the northern part. He's been focusing on the northern part. He felt that, you know, um, Islam has practiced in the north, has done a lot of damage to the people. And there's a need for people to speak freely about Islamic beliefs, about the life of Prophet Muhammad, so that people can really, you know, from there, make head and tail or make sense of what they want to take based on critical evaluation, not just indoctrination. So I think that that's his orientation. So he's just like a free mind, a free thinker, a free speaker, and who thinks that that is the only way that they can make sense of the harm being done, especially with the Boko Haram challenges and with all sorts of blasphemy accusations, killings and all that. So, so he's that kind of person, an enlightener, you know, somebody who really wants to awaken the people. So, and um, that was how he, that's exactly in line with what he was doing until that was um, 2020. You know, I just got a phone call that he's been, he'd been arrested because he made some posts on Facebook. Uh, before then, of course, I've had some of that the, the post he was making was generating some problem. And I really called him and he told me, yeah, um, yes, but that's exactly the goal. The goal is that when people get, you know, to react this way, you use that opportunity to educate them, to enlighten them. And he told me all sorts of stories about during the COVID then, that people were playing COVID cop, even when they said there was no, nobody should even come out, you know, that people came and instituted COVID cop, they were playing matches, they were sneaking into the mosque at night. So he told me all sorts of things because it mm. was that 2020 time. So so now, I, you know, got arrested and all that. So we started looking for him. We could not figure out where he was. And eventually about six, eight months later, we were told that he was in the police station in Kano. Then we started pressing for him to be brought to court. So, you know, that took us about a year again. And uh, maybe um, that was last year. Uh, he was uh, charged to court. And, um, and uh, of course, the main thing is that they said he, he, of course, he pleaded guilty. And he told me that was the only way wow. for him to get out of Kano. He told me that the, it was the only way. And the only way to 
get out of Kano without anybody being killed, either himself, his lawyer, or people around him. So because that the people did not have any strong case, and that if he wins, that they will come and kill him in the prison, and if they don't kill the lawyer at the court. So the only thing he needed to do was to plead guilty. They put him in prison, then pursuing that plea, then from there, he could escape. So that was the explanation he gave me because I had to meet him. I said, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Why did you plead guilty? And making the appeal process complicated. And he explained to me all he has suffered, intimidation, harassment, threat to life, and that he wanted to save everybody. That if that if they, if he wins that case, that people could come, hundreds of people could mm -hmm. invade the court, kill their lawyer, kill the kill the judge. And if they kill the judge, that the judge will believe that he will go to hell, heaven, you know, mm -hmm. because you know he's doing so. He told me a lot of stories that why that made him, you know, to do that. So, but we're now trying to appeal the case. But you know what is on the air now is politics, is election. So the courts are just yeah. congested, are focusing more on that. And especially a case like his, they will like actually want to put it by their side, you know, because of the political implications. So we are pursuing the appeal. And the Femi Falana is the one leading the appeal process uh, mm -hmm. at the moment. So but we're waiting for the court to give us a date. They gave us a date, but the court did not sit. But they told us that, you know, we should uh, wait for another date, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for the appeal. So that's exactly where we are. You know, that, that was interesting. Um, first of all, the fact that we have blasphemy laws in Nigeria is uh, counterproductive to the idea that Nigeria is a democracy. I believe that it is that we have free speech or not. Either we can't negotiate free speech you know, we can't on the one hand have blasphemy laws and then we pretend to be a democracy or we have free speech. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And I saw some of the posts he made that caused this controversy. It was it was on his personal Facebook account. Personal. Yes. He didn't go to the mosque. Yeah. He didn't write anything. Yeah. Uh yeah. he didn't write anything on the mosque. He didn't even mm -hmm. put any fire. It was on his mm -hmm. personal Facebook account. So why yeah. should why should he be arrested over over mm -hmm. his personal opinion, which he posted on his mm -hmm. personal? Facebook account. It doesn't make any sense. So yeah. it's a very slippery slope. It's, it's a slippery mm -hmm. slope, and um, it, it's even it's even sad that we have blasphemy laws in the first place. It's actually very very sad, and mm -hmm. and I hope that uh, it wins. I generally win it, it, uh, for the sake of democracy, for the sake of free speech. Mm -hmm. I hope mm -hmm. it wins the appeal, and mm -hmm. you know, it is set free as soon as possible. You know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The, the 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 thing is that yes, you see, when they say we have blasphemy laws, actually. Uh, they don't even understand the implication. Number one, there are blasphemy laws for religious majority to oppress minorities. Because if you watch what's going on, um, what they call blasphemy is what every religious person commits. Exactly. Because ask yourself, how can you promote and preach religion without committing blasphemy? Exactly. It's not possible. Exactly. So, so it negates freedom of religion and belief, including freedom to promote Islam. So mm, it mm. is those who are even using blasphemy laws as Muslims and are using it, they, are, they don't know that they are actually, you know, um, is a counterproductive, okay, yeah. if you look yeah. at it critically. Because, for instance, I come from the southern part, the southeastern part. I never saw a mosque till I was 20-something years. I didn't see a mosque. I never saw any person praying, a mm. Muslim, okay? So when you come to my place to preach Islam, it's blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if you think that black people should be killed or sent to jail, that means that Muslim preachers and evangelizers will be in jail. So mm -hmm. you can't make you can't make sense of preaching of religion and still you can comfortably defend blasphemy. So but, you know, the, the, what I'm saying there is that I agree with you. We shouldn't have it. But Muslims and the religious people should actually be the ones who say we shouldn't have it because they can't preach their religion. Because I, when some of them now want to preach to me or tell me anything about Islam, I say, look, it's blasphemy. What you are speaking, because it is contrary to my own, in quote, beliefs. And mm, it, it yeah. also, in yeah. quote, is insulting, yeah. you know, yeah. to my own beliefs. So what I'm saying there is that we have not actually understood the implications of having blasphemy laws vis-a-vis -vis our right to freedom of religion or belief and our right to freedom of expression. Hmm. All right. Okay, so... Tell me about your critical thinking projects, because I've seen a couple of your posts. You've gone to okay. different schools in Nigeria yeah. and educating young ones about critical thinking. And first off, I believe that we definitely need more of critical thinking as a people. We need to develop uh, a generation of critical thinkers, you know. So tell us about your projects in that regard. 
Yeah, uh, well, the all these years, you know, I've been trying to address the problem of um, um, maybe religion-based, superstition-based uh, abuses and superstition-based problems and uh, challenges. I've been asking myself, what could we do on the long term? How do we, you know, apart from going to schools to tell them, oh, witches are imaginary, um, you know, they don't cause malaria. You know, you say it like a preacher and you go and people still mm. continue believing what they're believing. So I've been asking myself, how do you do it? So mm. one of the one of the, the ideas I came up with was promoting critical thinking in schools. And um, and so I now ask myself, how do you also do it? Because you don't go to the schools and said, okay, think critically and you go home. Mm. No, how do you do it? So I now came up with the idea of, of what I call an operationalized definition, which is um, uh, which is uh, generating questions, you know, okay. in all areas of human en endeavor, and seeing the world as an object of curiosity. In other words, whatever you tell me is something to be questioned, as opposed to something to be believed. Okay, you know, because when somebody tells you, "Oh, uh, uh, Muhammad Buhari is the president of Nigeria," when you go to the exam, who is the president of Nigeria? You just write that. So immediately they teach you that there's a tendency to memorize it. Yeah. Okay. Now, but. It's, it, 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 I want a situation whereby in a, a different subject, when they tell you something, it is something to be interrogated, not something to be memorized. So interrogation should be part and parcel of the learning process. And in fact, a subject should be devoted to interrogating uh, objects of learning or things we are learning. And that teachers should have that as part of their discipline to stimulate the questioning faculty. So that was why I now said, okay, we could have a subject, you know, like that. And I went to, uh, I checked the National Policy on Education, page 10 of it. It had this uh, promotion of critical thinking as one of the aims of our primary education. So I said, well, you know, just take it and run. So what I did now, I now started developing materials where pupils are rewarded for asking questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that it's no longer how many answers you can get, you get rewarded. It's not how many questions you can generate. So I've been able to come up with book one, two, three. It is still work in progress, you know? And I try to make sure that if people don't see it as, in quote, anti-religion, just like the way science is. When you teach somebody sci to think scientifically, you are not telling the person in quote, not to believe or not to be, be religious and all that. When you question ideas, you can also entertain your religious beliefs. But I have a feeling that by institutionalizing it and making it part and parcel of the classroom uh, learning process, it can help people it disincline them from blind belief, dogmatic belief, an yeah. authoritarian approach to life. So mm -hmm. that's exactly where we are. And we've been go we've gone to maybe about um, 16 local governments in Oyo State, because that's exactly where I'm focusing now. Oh. And we've, we've trained over 2,000 uh, pupils, about one, over 1,500 teachers. So, and it's been well received. But of course, we are hoping that slowly and steadily, we can take the idea to more schools and get people to really understand that it is in our best interest as a country to have this subject introduced very early, not at, at the tertiary institution level. Now, just before I conclude, I also got inspired when I, I, I watched um, what they call this, um, uh, I think World Economic Forum, and they interviewed all these prominent technocrats. And they, and they were asked, what are the skills needed for 21st century jobs? And one of the skills they said was critical thinking. And I was like, wow, if that is the case, why can't we start this in our schools? Not just only to help address the harmful effect of superstition, dogmatic beliefs, but also to prepare our children and young people for the jobs of 21st century, not just locally, but globally. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Um, have you encountered any pushback from teachers, educators, or parents who might feel that uh, you are, in a way, trying to raise children to disobey them, you know, especially when it comes to cultural issues, religious issues, and things like that? Yes, 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 yes. Our teacher training is always, you know, uh, filled with a lot of concerns. Mm. You know, first of all, 
Teachers are concerned about how parents will be reacting when children get back and be asking them questions <laughs> right, left, and center. Uh, <laughs> this uh, is yeah. number one. And yeah. that culturally, children are not meant to be this kind of very exactly. uh, curious, inquisitive one. Exactly. That there could be a cultural pushback. Okay? Now, mm. I made them understand. My answer there is that, you know, um, it's just like telling people that when you learn science, you are not going to be practice religion and all that, that they should look out there. Scientists are leading the world. Okay. That mm -hmm. it is important to make them understand that the jobs of the 21st century, you know, are meant for critically minded students yeah. and all that. And that they are not just preparing them to come back home and be questioning their parents. They are preparing them, you know, for the world and all that. And that when they understand that there are, there's a global capital, global, um, uh, benefit in, in preparing the children that even if they ask them those questions at home, they won't find it as something, uh, you know, uh, they worry, to worry about. Secondly, some teachers we are worried that um, uh, pupils will ask them questions that they won't have the answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that they also would not want to come across as uh, maybe ignorant. not, you know, teachers. They're not yeah. ignorant or not knowing yeah. it. Yeah. Now, I told them that the purpose of critical thinking per se is to ask questions for question's sake. And right. that they should also be candid with students to say, okay, I don't know this. Because sometimes questions are not really meant to be answered. Questions are meant to stimulate research and uh, study and further knowledge. That when even if you are asked questions, you can say, okay, let me do some research. I'll give you the answer tomorrow. Or you throw the, uh, you throw the project open. Go home and look for answers to this. And that again, not all questions that you have immediate answers and that there are temporary, you know, this is what I know about this. But that it is important they understand that when they are teaching students and they're asking a lot of questions, that is a sign that they are really doing their work as teachers. That yeah. for me, they should see it as credit, you know, when they are, their children are even asking them questions that they are even finding it difficult to get the answers. So Definitely. this is how I'm trying to address the pushbacks yeah yeah you know um i remember growing up i think our culture has a way of socializing inquisitiveness out of children it has a way of doing mm -hmm. that children are naturally inquisitive they ask questions yes. and yes. as adults we get we get easily annoyed when they keep on asking questions and questions so we socialize that out of there and yes. I think it's, a, it's a damage we are doing to, to children subconsciously yeah. we are doing mm -hmm. some damage to them Children, we need to maintain that childlike curiosity, that childlike mm. inquisitiveness. If you can carry that to adulthood, I think mm. you can make a great scientist, you can make a mm. great researcher, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. You know, so I think yeah. it's it's a much needed skill we need to teach uh, children. All right, so we are running out of time. I have like six minutes yeah. more. Okay, so tell me about your advocacy against witchcraft in Nigeria. Yeah, um, that's another project that is also close to my heart because. Um, my, my my doctoral degree, I did it in religious studies, and my thesis is on witchcraft accusation. And I was in Ghana, the north of Ghana, where they have so-called witch camps. Uh, but these are ultra refuge centers where people, when they threaten to kill them, they just pack their things and come there mm. to stay and spend the rest of their lives. So, mm. so in the course of this, I had stories, very pathetic stories. People being stabbed to death, people being lynched, you know. And when you ask, what happened? What did this person do? They start telling you, yeah, it was somebody saw, saw her in a dream. I say, in a dream? Huh. Then after that, you go and kill somebody. Huh. Ah, that they went somewhere and somebody confirmed. I say, where? And I followed them to those places. These are old people who are trying to get some money to survive and all that. They throw stones on the ground and tell you it is this, it is that. Sometimes they don't even say exactly who they wish. They just say something based on the information you give them. Huh. So I just couldn't make head or tail out of what they're saying as the basis of accusation. So, mm -hmm. they, so what I did now, I now decided to start this campaign of advocacy. Just try to use the knowledge and findings now to turn it into some kind of intervention mechanisms. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I must tell you, we'll be making a little bit of progress, you know, based on the cooperation from the police. Sometimes they try to frustrate us, uh, but we try to also harass them and all that. Like in Benue now, we have a man who was who who, who was almost lynched. You know, he was lynched actually, but he survived. Yeah. You know, so we we're able to get the police, get the AIG, and all that. They were able to arrest five of the suspects. You know, this happened in October. The five of the suspects have been arrested and are being tried in a court. 
right there as we speak here now. So we have other cases in other places where ordinarily people would have resigned. Because what happens is that immediately they do it and they mob after that, after that you've been in the news, then after that you don't hear anything again till the next person is lynched and all that. So I'm saying no more. Let's make the message of never again. You know, if you do anywhere I hear it, we take action in such a way that people in that community will not be there to do it again. So we've been making some progress and all that, but it's been very frustrating because, of, of course, many cases that poor people, you need to take help, help them go to the police. You need to help them sometimes with medical bills and all that. But mm. we are making a difference and it's getting some visibility. But mm. of course, there's still a lot of work to be done to get people to understand that, you know, you can't just take laws into your hands. Even if you suspect that somebody killed you or you saw somebody in a dream, you don't have the right to go to the Definitely. person's house Definitely. and attack the person, set the person ablaze. You know, there was a particular incident in Bauchi State. Um, uh, the, an uncle, a grand uncle, gave a piece of meat to a child and uh, the child told the father. The father said, oh, the uncle had initiated, you know, the child into witchcraft world and went and beat this man to death. And set and set the house and the cops are blazed. You know, he's been he's been he has been arrested now and all that. So education, lobbying, you know, humanitarian assistance, depending on what the case is, that's what we have been trying to do and all that. So uh, we are making some progress, but there is still a lot of work to be done. Yeah, uh, you know, it's very um, it's almost impossible to believe that these are still happening in twenty first century Africa. It's almost impossible to believe. But anyway, how can people support your work, whether it's the critical thinking initiative or the anti-witchcraft uh, uh, campaign? How can they support your work? Yeah. Well, first, if you want to support our witchcraft work, be an advocate. Because our goal is not actually to form an organization. Our goal is to spread the idea. We, okay. we want a situation whereby anywhere there is any kind of allegation, people can easily send us a text message. Go to our social, go go to our Facebook. You can tag us there or tag me on Facebook. Send me information. Give me an, give us an idea of where it's going on and what is going on. Because look, the world is laughing at us that today we are still here lynching people accused of witchcraft. They're laughing at us. So let everybody become an advocate anywhere you are. Then for our critical thinking, please, if you are interested, you we have we have also a Facebook page. You can also reach me on Facebook. We can come to your school. We organize a workshop for 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 teacher for teachers free of charge. Now our textbooks are, are things we are printing them and all that. Of course, it will involve some cost. So what we are trying to say is that be the be our agent, be our contact person. Help us take this message further. I think that is the best support we can get because what we need what we need is just kind of a change. If if everybody embodies this change wherever you are, in your office, in your village, in your community, online, offline, in schools, on the road, in marketplaces and all that. I think it will help us, you know, build a better society because that is the goal of our advocacy. That is the goal of our critical thinking project. All right. I will, I will share uh, the links to your Facebook pages and everything in the description so people can click on that if they want to reach out to you. So thank you very much okay. for taking the time to talk to me today. Um, hopefully this yeah. will be the first of many conversations we'll be having. Um, so thank you very much again. Um, thank you. Yeah, for, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for everyone who watched. Please remember to like this video, share your thoughts below and subscribe to my channel. Um, thank you. So I'll see you guys in the next one. All right. Thank you, sir.